ending. It is a time when there is so much perversion institutionalized and accepted as the norm. Our culture has enshrined in it immorality, corruption, injustice, and all kinds of vice. And we need to take a stand against these things because the days are evil and we need to use the opportunities that God gives us to represent the kingdom of God in the situations that we are finding ourselves in. Amen? Amen. There's economic hardship and violence in our land. There is all kinds of social degradation and it's so hard to keep your mind pure when you are bombarded in the media by immorality as if it's an accepted thing. And there's so much influences which are post-Christian. It's not Christian at all. It is anti-Christian. And we are no longer in a time when people respect Christian values. Am I right in saying that? And so we have to take a stand. And we have to redeem the time, as it says in another version. Redeem the time. And the word used for time here is what is translated opportunity in NIV. And it's a Greek word, kairos, which means God's moment or season of opportunity. It is not talking about just chronological time. There's another Greek word, chronos, which means duration of time, time passing, clock time, if you will, clock time. But we're talking now about God's time, God's time of opportunity. And last time we heard how, well, uh, a sister shared at the end about opportunities which come our way and if we're not careful we let them pass when we could witness for the Lord at an opportune time when we could do things that God wants us to do to make maximum effect for the kingdom of God and we looked at some of that last time we want to be in God's place at God's time and so this verse Make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. It's not talking primarily about trying to pack a lot of activity into your schedule. It's more talking about being sensitive to the opportunities that God presents during the course of a day for you to make an impact for the kingdom of God. And so it's not talking about the classical time management thing where you look at your timetable and your schedule and you make sure that you're utilizing time to the most effective um, means and that you're doing as much as you can to minimize time wasting and so on. That is secondary, but primarily it is talking about being sensitive to God's appointments. Turn to your neighbor and say, be sensitive to God's appointments. Yes, God will bring people your way and they don't fit into your schedule. God will move you by his spirit to do things that are outside of your plans. But you have to be sensitive to God's leading. But does that mean then that we must not have plans and that we must be laid back and just event oriented and not really think about the different things that we need to do to improve our time management? Does that mean that, brethren? No. No. We must have schedules. We must have organization. But we must not be slaves to them. We must still be sensitive to the spirit that our timetable and our time frames, and God knows I'm preaching to myself this morning. <laughs> we must allow the spirit of God to disrupt our schedule if he so desires. Amen. And today I'm going to talk about making sure God is part of your planning and your scheduling so that you know, you don't have to mess up your plan and your timetable too much because he was involved in the actual planning of it. We today, as Christians, struggle with different symptoms of disorganization. How many people here are satisfied with your level of personal organization of your time and so forth? Let me see your hand. You are satisfied. How many people are not satisfied with how you organize your life? The vast majority of us. Amen. I feel a little better now. <laughs> but symptoms of disorganization prevail. There are clutters. Our desk and our houses and our bedrooms are cluttered. There is a list of forgotten appointments, missed deadlines, 
a lot of unfruitfulness and, and frustration. Some of us don't have that ability to finish the things that we start. How many of us struggle with that? You start to read a book and boy. Or you start a letter. Some of us, we <laughs> write letters over long periods of time. Or we start a diet. Oh, that's classic. I know somebody who start a diet and you don't reach very far and you get frustrated you know and sometimes we get overwhelmed and so dissatisfied because very often we don't seem to have time for the things that are very important but only the things that are urgent or apparently demand immediate attention and so our devotional lives get a blow and we don't have time to pray and seek God. And that is very serious, you know, brethren, because how can you be a Christian growing in the Lord and not have time to fellowship with God and receive sustenance and nurture from Him? It's like a little baby that is left on its own to breathe air and is not nourished and nurtured with the right nutrition so that it can grow strong and healthy. How many of you know that the Word of God is like sincere milk? That babies need. We spiritually need the word of God. Amen? I you know some of us are so busy we say that we are praying on the move. You know? Thank God for speaking in tongues. Because if it wasn't for speaking in tongues, some of us would hardly pray. You know, you're walking down your road and you're chaka chaka in and you're driving on the road and you're chaka chaka in. But let me tell you, that's not enough. That's not enough. So many of us spiritually just have a maintenance diet. If we were to see in the spirit, the condition of our souls, many of us will be malnourished <laughs> and barely breathing. If we were to treat our bodies the way we treat our spirits and souls in terms of nourishment, many of us would just be so skinny. You wouldn't have a weight problem. You would be flesh and bones. So then, we need to look at ways in which we can free up time for God and for the kingdom of God. There are things that we need to address. Time wasters, time killers, things that leak our time away, as it were. And I'll just list some of them. You can think of some after I give you my list. The first one is procrastination. You know what that is? Procrastination. Manana. Put off for tomorrow what can be done today. It is a reluctance to make important decisions. And for many of us, it is a built-in habit. You ever wondered why you put off certain things just as a matter of routine, and you can just get up and do them? Listen, brethren, it is very important that we address this. For some of us, it is a spirit of oppression that needs to be broken. The greatest time wasted often is the time getting started to do something. If you are like me, when you get started on something, you get rolling and the adrenaline start flowing and you get the thing done. Or if you are like me, you wait till the last minute until, boy, you just have to move and the adrenaline start pumping and you're motivated by fear and, and excitement. And that's not good. It's a bad habit. And I repent. But procrastination is something that we need to confront and deal with because it is the thief of time. Indecisiveness is a part of procrastination. And very often, we put off things that we find unpleasant to do. And we have to learn the skill and the habit of doing the unpleasant things first. If you have a list of things to do, try and do the more unpleasant things first. Get them out of the way. But that's the hardest thing to do, isn't it? But we have to force ourselves if we want to free up time for the work of God. One of the things that hinders us is that sometimes we are afraid when we see things that need to be done. We are overwhelmed because the thing seems so big and we feel overwhelmed by it. Isn't that true? You know what we need to do? Break these things down into small steps and start making the steps. Ask the Lord to help us. Amen? Amen? Sometimes it's good to even think of the reasons why you are putting off this thing. And deal with those reasons. Work to develop a habit of doing 
things in a timely way, doing the things that are unpleasant, deny yourself, get it done. Can you say amen? Turn to your neighbor and say, don't procrastinate. The second thing I would mention is perfectionism. That is, you strive for perfection. And some of us, believe it or not, have a problem with being too perfect. <laughs> you know, you want to dot every I and cross every T. And you want everything to be just so perfect. And sometimes you don't even trust God or other people because you think that you are the best person to get the thing done. Because you'll do it just how you want it done. But listen now, brethren, watch perfectionism. Accept your limitations and call for help. Let people help you get certain things done. Delegate. Eh? Some of us, we do every little thing. When somebody is supposed to do a job, we do it because we like doing it. We feel that it's going to be done the right way if we do it. But sometimes you have to come off that high horse of perfectionism. And let things falter, let people make mistakes, and allow things to go unperfect. You, you're understanding what I'm saying? Okay, some of us really have a big problem with that. Others, it's the opposite. <laughs> right? Enough said. Third, indiscipline. Lack of planning. Just sheer, plain laziness. Proverbs 6, verse 6 to 11 rebukes the sluggard or the lazy person. Brethren, you know that sloth, being a sluggard, is sinful. Yes? Turn to your neighbor and say, laziness is sin. And uh, you know, some of us really believe that and that's why we're so busy because we feel that when we are very busy, we are proving that we are not lazy. But busyness is not the opposite of laziness, you know. Because you can be very busy doing the wrong thing. You can be very efficient doing the wrong job. Are you with me? You must strive for effectiveness more than efficiency. Efficiency is doing the job in a good way or the best way. Effectiveness is doing the right job. Some of us are very busy solving problems that we have created. And very busy doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. And we feel good about being busy. Watch that. Plan and make sure your priorities are in order. Fourthly, imbalance. Brethren, we need to balance leisure. And here I'm preaching to myself. We need to balance leisure, rest, prayer, work, time with our families, and time with God. Balance is important. If you don't have balance, what will happen is that you will be going on a path that leads to diminishing returns. You know what I mean by that? You're doing more and more and getting less and less. You ever have that happen to you? When you see that happening, you must stop and take stock, you know. Because it don't make sense you're working these long hours and accomplishing less than when you're working shorter hours. Whether it is in your, in your workplace, sometimes you need to just rest and recharge the batteries. Fifth, intimidation. Intimidation. That is being afraid of people and allowing dominant people to determine what you do and what you don't do. Some of us need deliverance from people, especially strong willed people. Some of us soft and meek and mild. And we just let a strong willed person just dominate us. You know what I'm talking about, brethren? But God wants us to be free. From intimidation and the fear of man. It could be your boss, could be your husband, could be your wife. <laughs> but you must not, out of intimidation, be manipulated by people to do what they want and not what is your priority. Let the Lord set the priority. Amen? And you need to negotiate with people. If you're married, you need to sit down with your husband and say, Boy, Honey, I need time for so and so, and this is the reason. And negotiate. Don't just capitulate to the wills and the, the desires of, of people. Now, this might sound like I'm preaching rebellion, but understand me. I'm talking about not being intimidated and dominated by people so that you almost become somebody's slave. 
Do you think I'm right in, in saying that that is, that is a problem? Yeah. Break those bonds. Sometimes we are dominated by people because we have this bonding to them, a sense of obligation. You know, somebody do something nice for us, but listen to me. Brethren, don't live your life, the rest of your life, with this sense of obligation. It is bondage. You need to break the cords. Amen? Cut the cords of intimidation and bondage. It could be your mother. It could be somebody that saved your life when you're drowning. It don't mean that every time they call, you must answer. And when they say you must jump, you must say, how oh, high. And, you know, you're not anybody's slave. Amen? Cut the cord. Turn to your neighbor and say, cut the cord. Cut the cord of intimidation and domination by strong-willed people. You need to stand up and learn to say no. The Bible says in Titus 2 verse 11 that the grace of God that appears from heaven has taught us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we will say no to all ungodliness. We must learn to say no. No is a very important word in our vocabulary. Sometimes you just have to say, I'm sorry I cannot do so and so because it is my time to seek the Lord. Can you check me back later? Hello? Lastly, number six, addictions. And you might wonder what I'm talking about. Nobody here is a drug addict. I hope not. But addictions can take place with very normal things. You can be addicted to your work. You can be addicted to food. You can be addicted to gambling. Certain things are addictive. Certain drugs you get chemical dependence on. But look at the innocent things you can be addicted to. What about exercise? You know that you can be addicted to exercise. And there's a rush of excitement that comes when you jog and do aerobics. You know some of you people and you get almost addicted to it. Some people are addicted. Some people are addicted to sex. Some people are addicted to religion. Religion. You have some very religious people that need deliverance from religious addictions. Well, what is addiction? Or how can you tell if you are addicted to something? What about sports? What about cricket? Oh my Lord. Some of us, it's no problem to watch a test match the whole night. Not nowadays, eh? Nowadays, not so nice. But some of us have a sports addiction. And we are just taken up. Others of us are addicted to information. We have to listen to the 6 o'clock news. Then we have to listen to the 6.30 news. Then the 7 o'clock news can't miss us. Then we have to read the Gleaner Observer and the Herald. Time Magazine, Newsweek. Um, you know, Miami Herald. And you're just swamped with addiction to information. You have to be on the internet. You have to be all over the place getting information. For what? <laughs> Addictions. How do you know if you are addicted to something? Listen to the, the characteristics of addiction. One is that there is denial. So that's the first thing. If I say to you, you are a, a sports addict, you know, the first thing you're going to say is, who, me? You're joking. No way. not necessary. Some people just admit it. Yes, I'm guilty. Anyway, denial tends to be a feature of addiction. An alcoholic has a hard time admitted that, admitting that he's addicted. Right? Eventually, some of them do, and those are the only ones that get deliverance. You know, you notice that. But denial and dishonesty. And then, there's another feature, one, another feature, that of stress release. Addictions help you to escape from reality into a world of fantasy. Now, let me explain. There's nothing wrong with a little diversion sometimes, don't it? Sometimes you need to unwind, don't it? And relax. Nothing wrong with that. But you see, if you start to live in a world of fantasy, through the mills and boons and the soap operas, and you start to put yourself in it, the young and the bold and the old and the restless, you know... And you start to put yourself into these things and, and feel so deeply and crying. and <laughs> Susie Ann lost her baby this week and next week she's going to lose her husband. And Sometimes you all know what's coming in. And you're just there and you're just there, you're just there, you're just there wasting time. God says, 
Watch that because sometimes it's living a life of illusion, escaping from reality because reality is very painful. Am I right? Reality is unpleasant, but we are not to escape into our addictions. A third feature is that addictions tend to get you isolated from people. It helps you or it makes you substitute good relationships with people. A man who is a sports addict, for instance, would take him red stripe beer, cock up his foot, and him just oblivious, ob oblivious to everything else. You know, him wife, him children, everything, and him just watching sports continuously, three hours straight sometimes. And you know, some of you that have a problem staying in church for two hours, ah, you watch them football game and things like that for three hours, and you, know, no, you don't blink. Hello? You can say, ouch. Well, listen, and when you're addicted, you begin to cut yourself off from people because you get caught up in your little world of addiction. And I'm talking about some ordinary things, and I spend time on this because I know it is a problem that hinders the children of God from being true disciples of Jesus Christ. And we need to take a stand against these things. We need to identify them and break them in our lives. If we need help, we need to call for help. Can you say amen? amen. Addictions, obviously, provide a preoccupation that consumes us. And a very important one is that there is a progression. When you are addicted to something, it gets worse and worse. Huh? It gets worse and worse over time. If you are addicted to food, you eat more and more, and it gets worse and worse over time. All right? And so when you look at these traits, you, if you can identify anything in your life that fits into these type of categories, you need to be very concerned. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 12 says that all things are lawful, but all things are not expedient. I will not be brought under the power of anything. You must not be under the control of anything. I don't care if it is drinking coffee in the morning to get you up and, and on the go. You understand? You must not be dependent on anything chemically, emotionally, and, or, well, only spiritually you must be dependent on the Lord. Amen? Very important. Those things eat our time. And if we need deliverance, let's get help. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, get help, get help, get help. Huh. Next thing, we must schedule times of stillness to hear from God. There are people that will tell you that you don't need to have devotion.